In order to derive various kinds of machine learning and statistical algorithms, it's important to understand how to manipulate joint probability distributions. When talking about probability distributions over multiple variables, one of our most basic concepts is the idea of marginalization. When we compute the marginal distribution of some subset of variables in a joint probability distribution, we're computing the distribution that we would get if we restricted our attention only to that subset of the variables. That is, imagine that you had samples from both X and Y together, but somebody came and threw away all the Ys. The resulting distribution would be the marginal distribution over X. As our starting point then, if we had a joint distribution over just two variables, X and Y, then the two marginals available to us are P of X and P of Y. For discrete distributions, we compute marginals by summing over the variables that we're not interested in. This is sometimes called the sum rule of probability. For continuous random variables, we compute marginals by integrating out the variables that we don't care about. Here we can visualize marginalization in a discrete distribution in which y has three possible outcomes and x has five possible outcomes. The probability mass function is then a table with 15 entries in it that all sum to one. To compute the marginal distribution over y, we would sum over the rows. To compute the marginal distribution over x, we would sum over the columns. In the continuous setting, it's a little bit harder to visualize things, but conceptually, it's the same. This orange surface represents a joint probability density function over x and y. If we were to separately integrate this PDF over its two axes, we would get two probability density functions representing the marginals p of x and p of y. Having established the concept of a marginal distribution, we can now define conditional distributions. Conditional distributions fix a subset of variables and then ask what the resulting density is on the remaining variables. For both discrete and continuous variables, we get the conditional distribution by dividing the joint distribution by the relevant marginal. The only difference is whether we sum or integrate in order to compute that marginal. When we talk about conditional distributions, we say something like probability of x given y, and we use a vertical bar to denote that. Let's imagine going back to our discrete PMF from earlier. We compute the marginal distribution over the three outcomes, y1, y2, and y3. Now, if I wanted to talk about the distribution over x, given that y equals y2, I would essentially ignore the other two rows of this table. Then I would divide that row by the marginal probability that y is equal to y2. It is again a little bit harder to see in the continuous setting, but the concept is the same. The surface represents a joint probability density function over x and y. I'm sweeping along a blue curve that is the conditional distribution over x given a fixed y. The computation of a conditional distribution by dividing a joint distribution by a marginal can also be referred to as the product rule. All that's happened here is we've multiplied both sides by the marginal p of y. And of course we also could have done this decomposition by conditioning on x instead. The celebrated Bayes rule is really just taking both bits on the right and dividing both of them by the marginal over y. So Bayes' rule is really just an identity arising from the product rule. The reason Bayes' rule gets a lot of attention in statistics and machine learning is more about interpretation of random variables than it is about the equation itself. Specifically, when someone talks about being Bayesian, what they're saying is that they're willing to use Bayes' rule to construct a distribution over parameters. That is, someone who's being Bayesian is willing to not just use random variables to describe noisy things in the world, but also to describe their own uncertainty. Not everyone agrees that this is an appropriate use of probability. Nevertheless, it's an appealing framework for reasoning about data because it allows you to take a priori beliefs about parameters and then incorporate new knowledge you get from data. In the language of Bayesian inference, we start with an a priori distribution over the parameters that we call a prior. Then the likelihood function scores those parameters according to how much probability they assign to the data. Then this function is normalized into a proper probability distribution by dividing it by the probability of the data, or the marginal likelihood, sometimes also referred to as the evidence. Finally, we get the a posteriori distribution over the parameters conditioned on the data, sometimes called the posterior. I think it's also worth taking a few minutes to talk about expectations. The expected value of a function under a probability distribution is the average value of that function under samples drawn from that distribution. For discrete random variables, you take a sum over all possible values of f of x weighted by p of x. In the continuous case, you do an integration instead. To visualize this, the orange curve shows a simple probability density function. This blue line is a function whose expectation we'd like to take. The product of these two functions is shown in green. Finally, we integrate the green line in order to get the expected value. 
The simple case of expectation that you're used to is, of course, the mean of a distribution. Here I'm doing exactly the same visualization again, except the function is the very simple straight line x. While we're talking about expectations, it's also useful to talk about variances. The variance is the expected squared deviation from the mean. Again, we use the same visualization, but now f of x is the parabola centered at the mean. There are some important properties of expectations that you should always keep in mind. The first is that expectation is linear. That is, the expectation of a weighted sum is the weighted sum of the expectations. Another thing to keep in mind is that the expectation of a product of two random variables is not in general equal to the product of the expectations. The important case when this is true is when the two random variables are independent. Another property of expected values that comes up a lot in machine learning is Jensen's inequality. It says that a convex function applied to an expectation is always less than or equal to the expectation of that function. Let's also take a minute to talk about properties of variances. Variances are always non-negative, and as we said before, they're the expected squared deviation from the mean. One useful identity to know is that the variance is equal to the difference between the expected square and the square of the expectation. Variance is not in general linear, and if I take the variance of a random variable multiplied by a scalar, then I get the variance of that random variable multiplied by the square of the scalar. It's also useful to know that the variance of a sum of independent random variables is equal to the sum of the variances of the two random variables taken separately. Now these are just a few of the important properties of expectations and variances, but they're good tools to have in the toolbox when you're tackling problems in machine learning and statistics.